Welcome to another episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest on. I'd say we have Richard Pettigrew. He's a professor of philosophy at the University of Bristol with particular interests in formal epistemology, philosophy of mathematics, logic, and theory of rational choice. He also set up the foundation year in arts and humanities. He has worked outside the university on projects addressing literacy in prisons and supporting adults with learning disabilities. And he's a contributing author to uh, Helen de Cruz's uh, book, uh, Philosophy Illustrated, 42 Thought Experiments to Broaden Your Mind. Welcome, Richard. Thank you very much. This is great. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, and then so just as we were off air for a little bit, we were talking about how fascinating the concept of the self is. And so Richard's particular chapter deals with the self and me as a psychotherapist, right? And sort of Alan, who has this kind of niche about the ego and trying to understand like how we kind of get in our own ways and how we self-sabotage. I was thinking like, wow, man, this is going to be one of the best episodes of the year. Like legit, I looked at this chapter and I said, this is going to be it. I said, cool. we could probably go on for hours about it. So all right, uh, just to begin, Richard, so can you tell us a little bit about the thought experiment of the, notion, the Russian nobleman, and in particular, obviously, how it applies and what it teaches us, or rather, maybe what it gets us to think about in terms of the self. Mm. Sure, of course. Uh, no pressure is going to be the best, uh, best episode ever. Um, <laughs> so the, the Russian nobleman, so it's the thought experiment is, is given by Derek Parfit, who's um, an ethicist um, based at Oxford for, for nearly all of his career um, and died uh, a few years ago. Um, he, he didn't write not a huge amount in his life, but one of the, the things he did write was this book, Reasons and Persons, um, published in 1984 and became incredibly influential um, in ethics. And a lot of ethics kind of in the last 30 or so years has been kind of in response to that and has, has, um, has taken that as its starting point. So, so this thought experiment comes from from part of it, although, I mean, an interesting kind of aside is, I think, although he doesn't say this, He's taking the idea from a, an unfinished play by Tolstoy. So there's this unfinished play by Tolstoy called The Light Shines in the Darkness. And although it doesn't make exactly the same point that, um, that Parfit's making, it's, I, I mean, the, the, the drama turns around exactly the same sort of case. So the case is this. So you've got um, a Russian nobleman. So we're kind of in, in, in Russia in the 19th century. And you've got this young guy in his 20s. Um, who uh, is, a, is a count, and upon his father's death, he will inherit a huge amount of land and money and wealth and so on. But he's a young guy, he's 20 year old, he's an idealist, he's a socialist, he thinks that it'd be much fairer, much more just, if all that money that he was going to inherit would instead go to the people who farm his father's land, if the people who actually have worked the land for their whole life would in fact get that land and it would become their property. So what he decides to do is he decides to create a sort of legal document that binds him to doing that upon inheritance of his father's land. So when his father dies, this document will kick in and it, the, the wealth, the land will transfer to the people who have been working, for, working on the land for his whole life. Um, and the, but then he, he, he realizes that, you know, he's seen people who have been idealistic like he has in his youth change over the course of their life. And as they've got older, they've moved from being these kind of young socialists to becoming much more bourgeois in their, in their older life. And he thinks, maybe that will happen to me by the time my father dies. Maybe I'll have lost all of my socialist ideals. And maybe by the time he dies, I will... Um, uh, I will want to keep all the money for myself and I'll kind of just be exactly like my father was. And so what he does is he, he makes this legal document, but he ensures that um, he can't void it himself. But someone has to be able to void it. And so he nominates his wife to be able to void it. So if she says it's void, then the, the, the document doesn't hold any more and the land goes, goes to him instead of the, the people who've worked it. OK, so that's the, that's the beginning. Time passes, 20 years later, his father dies and you know, he's set to inherit the land or this legal document set to kick in. And indeed his fears have come true. He has changed. He's no longer the socialist of his youth. He's no longer this kind of young idealist who wants the land to transfer to these people who've worked it. Instead, he wants to keep all the, um, the land for himself, all the money for himself. 
So he says to his wife, okay, you're the only person who can void this document. Please void it um, so that they don't get the land, I get it instead. And the question that, that Parfit asks us is, what should his wife do in that circumstance? Should she void the, um, the, the document or, and, and let him have the land, or should she keep it in place and uh, the money transfers to, um, to, the, to the, um, the people who work the land? So in some ways, that's the thought experiment, okay? You can just set up this story about what's happened. You get to a certain point in it and you ask this question, what should she do? And Parfit thinks you're going to agree with him and you're going to think she shouldn't do it. She shouldn't void the document. She should keep it as it is. So, But there's something kind of mysterious about this. Okay. Why shouldn't she do this? What's wrong with doing this? Why is it a mystery? So what happened when you know, he, he, he created this document and, and made it the case that um, only she could void it and made her promise that she, she wouldn't void it if he asked her to. You would think, usually in that sort of situation, if someone you made a promise to then tells you, kind of releases you from that promise, then it's no longer valid. It's no longer, you know, you're, you're long, no longer bound by the promise. Right. So like now this guy's here, the nobleman's kind of, you know, releasing her from the promise. So why doesn't she do as he asks and, and, and void the documents and release to, the, to the, the people who work the land? And Parfit thinks, well, he invites us to sort of agree with him that the best way to explain our reaction to that case is to think that really the nobleman later on in life, at, at 40 years old, once he's become bourgeois, is a different person in some important sense mm -hmm. from the person who um, she made the, the, um, the promise to originally. And that's the only way you can explain the fact that she has not in fact been released from the promise that she, she made. Mm -hmm. Because if he is the same person, then he is able to release her from the promise and then she's able to, to kind of void the document and so on. But you don't think that's what should happen. So you've got to explain that somehow. And the best explanation Parfit thinks is you should um, think that, that he's changed. He's no longer the, the same person. So that's the thought experiment. Um, yeah. So he believes that she should honor the promise because it was a different self, a different person who asked her to maintain that promise. That's, that's that's very interesting. Uh, I wonder what I would do in that situation. Yeah, like wait, can, I, can we just before we go sure. on? Can we just clarify what are the two different understandings and senses of the self here? So this is a big part of so what Parfit's arguing for. So Parfit, I mean, there's a lot of things that he contributed, but one really crucial contribution he made to ethics was a bunch of arguments that all had the same sort of conclusion, which was the relation of personal identity is not the most important or is often not the important relation in ethics. Okay, so what does that mean? So personal the relation of personal identity is just the relation that I bear to some other, well, to um, someone at another time when I'm the same person as them. So I bear that relation to, um, the person that was me on my 14th birthday at midday or something like that, or mm -hmm. I will bear it to whoever the person is that's kind of me on my 70th birthday and so on. So the thought is, you know, we, we're, 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 we're things that endure throughout time ourselves, the people, people we are, are things that endure throughout time. The relation of personal identity is the relation that holds between any part of us at one time and part of us at another time. And it had kind of been a, um, yeah, kind of assumption of a whole bunch of, well, particularly Western ethics, that that relation is crucial in all sorts of parts of ethics. Um, you know, when you ask certain sorts of um, ethical questions, you all often have to kind of decide questions about kind of personal identity in order to kind of come up with the right answer. Mm -hmm. And Parfit was arguing, in fact, that's not the case. Lots and lots of cases, there are going to be um, times where that's not the important relation. There's some other relation 
that holds between these different kind of stages of a person, what he calls selves. Um, different, there's another relation that holds between those that's more important for, for ethical thinking or for kind of thinking about how you live your life. Um, and I think he thought, I think he realized that's kind of a weird theory. A lot of people are going to think that's that's got to be wrong. It's got to, you know, there's something so crucial about this thing that is me. Um, you know, this, this kind of sense of personal identity of this, this one sort of indivisible self that endures throughout my whole life. That's such a crucial part of a whole bunch of um, Western thinking. I think he thought, well, look, this is going to be quite a surprising uh, conclusion. Uh, to a lot of people, uh, it's going to be very surprising to think that a bunch of ethics, in a lot of cases in ethics, that's not the important relation. And so what he wants to do with this thought experiment is to try to convince us that actually there's a whole bunch of quite natural, normal judgments that we make that are only really best explained by this theory that he's, he's thinking of. Because, you know, this, this count, this Russian nobleman, I mean, he is in some ways the same person at 20 and at 40. I mean, it's not like his wife thinks, oh, I'm literally married to a different person now than I was at 20. Still thinks, you know, same person, same name, you know, all that sort of thing. But there's also this other sense in which the self that he was at 20 is very weakly related in some way to the self he was when he's 40. And that, the reason for that is so much of him has changed. And in particular, this really crucial part of him, his moral sensibilities have changed, his politics have changed. He's gone from being a socialist to being kind of bourgeois, um, uh, kind of, you know, um, sort of fan of personal property and so on. Um, so yes, and I mean, it's a really interesting thing. This is maybe I'm kind of another aside, and we can get onto this, that there's um, a really nice um, paper by Nina Strominger and Sean Nichols called The, the Moral um, Self, where they show that actually what Parfit's suggesting there in this thought experiment is exactly something that you can, it's not, it's not just Parfit's own judgment, um, but in fact, this is a very well attested judgment, this is a very well replicated judgment, um, that what's important for someone to judge kind of whether you're really the same self or whether your self has changed dramatically is your moral um, you, you, the moral judgments that you make, the moral sense that you have. Because you might think there's a bunch of people, you know, like um, I know when Helen was on, she was talking about John Locke's example of the, the cobbler and the prince. Mm -hmm. Someone like Locke thought that the really crucial relationship was sharing memories with um, your earlier self. So what makes me the same now as myself when I'm 14 is that there's a kind of um, bunch of memories that we have in common, namely kind of things that happened when I was like 10 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Locke thought that was the crucial thing for personal identity. You had to have this kind of chain of um, selves going back in time, each one of them kind of uh, connected by um, overlapping memories. And actually this work by Strominger and Nichols shows that's, that's not a big component of people's judgment of similar selves. It's the, the really important judgment is, do you have the same morality? So even if, you know, if I share loads and loads of um, memories with an earlier self, if I'm, you know, currently abhor meat eating and my earlier self you know, loved meat eating, um, then will judge me to be a kind of different person. You know, that people will tend to take that to be the really crucial feature of someone that kind of makes them who they are and and so on. So, so anyway, that, that's just by way of saying, you know, this is not just Parfit kind of doing the standard philosophy thing of throwing out an example and hoping all his kind of friends and his same social class are, are going to kind of agree with his, in, his response to it. I mean, he kind of does do that, but in fact, it's been, it's been kind of well attested by psychological literature afterwards that this is, this is what we in fact do. So, yeah. Right. Would it be just then based on that common sense judgment that I think all of us have, where we just judge a person by their actions? So I think it's, it's partly that, but I think um, they're going to say, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, um, understanding the Strominger and Nichols thing, it, it, you know, if the, the really crucial thing is, um, you know, what they in fact believe, like the morality they in fact have. So suppose you could have someone where their actions don't reflect their morality, right? Suppose, you know, someone is um, uh, actually kind of, you know, 
thinks there's nothing wrong with meat eating, but their social group are all kind of really strict and kind of, um, mm. uh, um, yeah, strict vegetarians. And so they maybe never do in fact eat meat, but actually that doesn't in any way reflect their moral sensibility. So it's, it's kind of, the thought is that, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of discovery in some ways that maybe it's, maybe it seems natural, but it, yeah, it, it wasn't like it was one of the options that was really kind of out there in the philosophical literature in a big way that the kind of crucial thing that keeps you yourself is, you know, your moral beliefs. Mm -hmm. People were thinking things like, oh, kind of, you know, chains of kind of overlapping memories and um, uh, maybe your body, you know, retaining the same body, maybe that was crucial, or maybe retaining the same brain, that was crucial. But there weren't that many people out there who were saying, no, no, the crucial thing is retaining your kind of moral moral beliefs. And yet yeah, this this result seems to suggest this and, and Parfit's kind of playing on that, that idea. Mm -hmm. okay, Alan, yeah. what did you what did you want to say earlier? Do you remember? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what choice we would make if we were in Anna, um, the nobleman's wife's place, mm -hmm. right? Um, maybe not even, let's say we weren't aware of uh, Parfit's uh, view, mm -hmm. right? Like, what, what would you actually do? What would you have done? So that's what, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm <laughs> thinking that, I'm thinking that I actually would probably think, oh, okay, this person here has developed from his earlier self. He maybe, maybe, of course, he was idealistic uh, in his younger years. And so, of course, he would ask his wife to make that kind of promise. But he's, he's learned the ways of the world, maybe. Maybe I would assume that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe he's, yeah. Maybe there's something else that altered his uh, worldview that allowed him to think, okay, um, maybe I should retain this property. And I don't know what else um, I could assume from there, but um, maybe I, I would assume his uh, intelligence has gone up. He's, he's developed as a person and therefore maybe I should annul this promise. Right. Maybe. Well, okay, wait, can I, can I reframe it to you guys and just to get your opinion on this? Sure. So imagine this, right? So imagine that we change it from um, some sort of like uh, a state or whatnot to divorce, right? So imagine if, you know, he says to his wife, okay, um, so look, I'm going to be different in 50 years, but I really love you right now. And I'm just going to be out of my mind then and I might ask for a divorce. Don't let me divorce you. Don't do that. Let's not get a divorce, right? I don't care what I say in 50 years. Do not let me divorce you. Then what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> that gives me pause i don't know what would you do right okay so yeah in that case i would say no so why i did so this is just obviously my perspective uh so why i disagree with the thought experiment is because people are consistently changing and i think the self in in yeah right so i don't think that there's an obviously and you know this is sort of found in, a, in science and philosophy i don't think that there's such a thing as an eternal stable self so it's like all of these things that we call the self or these aspects of ourselves of ourselves the physical the emotional the behavioral right these are all the self I don't think that there's a crucial aspect of the self. Like when we talk about moral values, I think it's one aspect of the self, right? And so because moral values change, unless, I mean, unless you're at a point where, and, and I mean, this goes into a little bit of the psychology of it, right? Unless you're at a point where you're sort of a harm to yourself or others, maybe because of some neurodegenerative disease or, you know, some sort of mental illness where obviously we would step into, you know, save you in some sense. I think at the end of the day, we all change. And I mean, it's a fact of life. It's sort of like, I mean, even the whole construct of marriage, I mean, thankfully, you're able to get a divorce, but it's a little bit ludicrous because we all change. We all have different sort of perspectives as we grow up, as we age. Sometimes, by the way, even our perspectives devolve. Sometimes we become a little bit more kind of cynical and delusional. Mm -hmm. But my thinking is, as sort of free human beings, we are allowed to do that and we are allowed to change our minds. And because we are allowed to change our minds, why should we bound? Why would why should we bind ourselves and even have other people contribute in binding ourselves to agreements that we wouldn't make, you know, 20, 30 years down the line? Mm. I know, Richard, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, 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 there's a lot I agree with in that. And, and, and to be, I not, there's parts of the, the Parfit thought experiment that I think are really sort of troubling. I mean, one, one thing which I, th I think is kind of what you're, is, is in agreement with what you're saying is, it's not really clear that that 20 year old self has any more authority over the question of the inheritance than the 40 year old self. And right. so it's not really clear right. why, even if you do think with Parfit that, you know, the promise, um, you know, that, that um, you, you know, the, the wife can't be released from the, um, from the promise, 
there's a kind of sense in which this later self has just as much authority over the kind of question of, you know, who gets the estate as the 20 year old self, in which case the 20 year old was kind of asking an unfair thing in the first place to make any kind of binding document about what would happen later on because they were kind of essentially taking away from their 40 year old self what they do. So I, 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 know, I, I don't know if that's kind of what you're, uh, partly what you're saying that look, you, you know, we change over um, time, it's kind of unfair or not. Yeah, it's not not really appropriate to kind of make these binding, um, you know, decisions earlier on that that kind of affect later later self. I think that's right. I mean, one thing to say about the Parfit thing is, I mean, he's not he doesn't think there's anything wrong with this change. He thinks like you do. I mean, he thinks we change all the time. In fact, I mean, one of the um, so so a big part of not a big part, but a one of the kind of major contributions of, of this book is he looks into kind of what would change about how we approach the world if we took on his viewpoint. Right. And one of the big claims he makes, I don't know how many people really find this plausible, but one of the claims he makes that seems very autobiographical as if it had a massive profound effect on him was thinking this way removes our fear of death. That's, that's a big um, thing. And the, the, the reason is you've in fact done it already, you know, whatever death is it's happened to you already you know what whoever you were when you were seven years old that self is gone now and all that death will really mean is that you know your self at the point that you die will will uh, will go but so have all your previous selves the only difference with death is there's no further self that will come along to replace it that you would think of as kind of related to you in some particularly strong way so that's one big kind of consequence of, of this way of thinking about kind of people as made up of kind of a, a, as kind of collections of selves in the same way as nations are collections of people. The other thing he thinks is it gives you a kind of reason to be altruistic in some way, or he thinks that, you know, we always think about, um, uh, you know, the rational thing to do as being the um, the selfish thing to do or the kind of self-interested thing to do you know the thing you should do from a rational point of view is whatever gets you what you want but if you start thinking of you yourself as just this collection of selves and like everyone else you know is just these collections of selves and all that's really important are these kind of relations of of connection between them then me now might be much more connected to like my best friend's current self than I am to my 70 year old self. You know, I probably won't recognize, you know, if I were to meet my 70 year old self now, there's a lot I just wouldn't recognize about myself and them. They'll have totally different views about all sorts of things, they'll have very different moral views, they'll have different experiences. Mm -hmm. I might find myself much more connected to, you know, my best friend's current self. And so part of it thinks that this, there's this kind of sense in which actually, not just the morally right thing to do is kind of like looking out for your friends, but actually that's kind of the rational thing to do, or it's the rational thing to do in, a, in exactly the same sense as the rational thing to do is to look after, you know, kind of make, do things that will, that will make your 70 year old self um, go well. He thinks you're, yeah, he's kind of, in a way he's kind of taking down the barriers between people because he doesn't think, I think the way to think of what his viewpoint is, you know, we've before thought of this kind of, sequence of selves that make up us ourselves you know me myself as being somehow uniquely important right. but they're not they're just a bunch of selves that i'm connected to to some greater or lesser extent but then you're also a bunch of selves that are connected to a greater or lesser extent and i might be connected to one of yourselves more strongly than i am to one of my future selves or one of my past selves and so i should kind of yeah this idea that the egoist should just look out for themselves is kind of breaks down and, and so on so he so th this is all by way of saying i think he would completely agree with you it's a wonderful thing that we all change and part of what makes that good is that it means that we're all made up of these different selves and that's partly what allows us to kind of see that death is not going to do this terrible thing and also to see why we might want to help other people and so on wow so essentially by perfect making one realize that you've already experienced psychological death before essentially his realization helps you to you know quote unquote die before you die mm -hmm. therefore not prioritize your own survival um the way you might have before and thus changing the relationship with yourself and with 
others. I know it's probably a very general, yeah. but that's interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've taught um, courses on, on death and illness and disease and so on quite a lot. And I wouldn't say it's a big hit with students, that particular um, kind of argument. I mean, Parfit says, it seems, I mean, there's a very beautiful passage, I wish I could find it in, in the book, um, where he, he essentially explains how that, what a profound effect this realization had on him. Um, but I, I don't know how general that is, but that's definitely his thought is that, um, yeah, he's, he's sort of, um, by breaking down, yeah, by seeing death as just something you've sort of been through before. Right. Um, although it's an acute version of what you've been through before, you know, it happens suddenly rather than most changes in selves are kind of gradual sort of tapering out of oneself and sort of, you know, bringing in of another self. Plus the, the egoistic uh, tendency to preserve your own survival is essentially one that comes from a fear of death. But if you already know that you've faced death so many different times, um, psychologically, then, yeah. then that prioritization might not tend to occur. I right? love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you become desensitized to it. Just knowing like, Oh, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's right. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. Does that, does it, does it, does it, you know, does that work for you? And then, uh, okay. So I like it. I definitely like it for sure. No, because if, if essentially, you know, that you've experienced, uh, a, a death before, right then that releases you from essentially needing to prioritize um fear and keeping yourself safe and within a, a boundary and sense of self that you're familiar with because you're always going through some sort of uh psychological death of the uh, uh, at some point so um being aware of it instead of just being caught in the automaticity of it um changes your relationship to it i know that's a, hopefully that works yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have to sort of think this through but essentially i i like it yeah, yeah so yeah so for, for me it doesn't uh just because for me these minor deaths are very imperceptible so if we're talking about changing beliefs right we're talking about like sort of you know like the strands on your head you know your fingernails right these are all imperceptible i will be fully aware of my full scale death right i will well i mean yeah. maybe i would say highly likely right <laughs> so uh I, this is so different than i think having a part of you yeah. go away as having the whole right so the distinction there for me is just way too important so again i could understand that and if there were a way uh, uh, I don't know, I guess if there were a way for death to be degenerative, maybe like an Alzheimer's, that wouldn't be so scary, just because again, it's little by little, even still people with Alzheimer's experience like terror, because they know of what's coming. I mean, a lot of them do, right? So if that's the case, uh, yeah, no, I would say no, it doesn't do anything for me. Just because again, like, even though these are minor deaths, we don't really perceive them or consider them so right. So even just thinking about them as minor deaths, I still don't the, the experience is not there of it as a death, right? I, so I don't know whether that's just because of the way I understand it. I don't know whether that's just the way perceptions just naturally work, but I think that there's a different actual experience of knowing that you're going to die and experience dying as opposed to like these minor deaths that we experience on a daily basis. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's right. And I think, yeah, it's sort of the, the acuteness is, is very important though. I mean, an interesting thing, this isn't so much in Parfit, but in kind of more kind of later work about changes in selves. So there was a kind of, um, I think it's about 2007, there was a, um, a couple of papers, one by um, a philosopher, an economist called Ed Edna Ullman Margolet, um, which was about kind of making decisions about these big kind of changes in self. So um, her point was, it's not just that these changes themselves just happen to you. You know, it's not, it's not purely a passive thing. Sometimes you can make decisions that will lead to these changes happening. So examples she has are things like emigrating to a different country, perhaps where that country's cultural norms are very different from, from the one in, from your home country or um, becoming a parent or taking on a new kind of line of work. Or she has an example of joining a revolution. And she thinks in all of these cases, you um you choose something you sort of know will lead to a change in you i mean you don't know it for sure some people emigrate and then they retain exactly the same 
kind of character and self. Some people become parents and it just doesn't seem to affect them. But a lot of people who had these major kind of life shifts do say, actually, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm a completely different person now from the one I was before. And one thing with the becoming a parent case, which um, the philosopher Laurie Paul, who's also got a thought experiment in the in Helen's book, um, one example, the example of, of, of becoming a parent, she thinks happens very suddenly. It's a kind of, you know, not quite the first time you hold your child in your arms, but, you know, it's over a kind of, you know, short period of a, a week or so afterwards. And so, so some of these philosophers think, yeah, you can also have these very acute changes. And so it's not just that always one self kind of fades out while, you know, the other self kind of fades in. Sometimes there's this kind of just abrupt end of a track and then the next one just starts. So, um, yeah, I think that that's meant, I suppose that sort of case would be more like the death case, you know, where it's a kind of an abrupt thing that will that will happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I tend to agree that I, I don't think it completely removes the fear of death, but I think there is something very helpful about the um, no longer thinking of this kind of enduring thing that is me as being some somehow of central crucial importance that really what matters are these individual selves that make it up that are important and and this that that there's some you know that it's just okay to not care so much about you at 70 years old as you care about you know kind of a friend now just because well you know, I don't really feel much connection to that self at 70 years old. And also perhaps helps, you know, to release you from promises that you made to yourself earlier in your life. Right, right. You know, if I made a promise to myself at one earlier stage in my life that I would, you know, I don't know, do a particular thing, you know, pursue a particular career, or perhaps if that earlier self kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, put in a bunch of work to become a kind of great guitarist or something like that. But I've changed completely now. And you know, that, that earlier self sort of made a promise to themselves that they've put in all this work in order to do it. And now I just think, oh no, I'm not interested in that, I'm gonna move on. Right. I think by releasing yourself from this idea that there's this kind of enduring person that kind of lasts throughout that, you know, and it was you that promised yourself, rather it was your kind of old self that promised themselves that they would do something, but that doesn't mean, you know, doesn't matter to you anymore because you're no longer them. I think that can kind of be helpful for approaching your life and um, thinking about kind of, you know, what you owe to your past. Yeah, you know, what, I love, what, you owe. what I love about Sorry. philosophy, yeah, no, it's okay. So what I love about philosophy is that it's really dependent and it's sort of, well, it's contextually dependent and it really depends on you know, who you're pretty much applying these ideas to. So what I was thinking about when just going back before even I was talking about like just death and the concept of the self in that respect, you know, we were talking about uh, the connections that we feel with other people, right? So I was actually thinking about somebody who would be, uh, this is not an official clinical diagnosis, but this is something that we see in therapy all the time. You know, we know people like this, people who are compulsively altruistic. So for them, right, who pretty much give everything away, they always feel more connected and dependent on the people in their lives than they do to their future selves, right? So if you were to apply this to that person, that person would be like, great, I have a justification for my compulsive altruism. So now I could just give the shirt off my back and worse, I would even not even uh, maybe even feel the slight bit of terror that I may about my future self and, you know, my future self, uh, you know, uh, let's say, you know, being poor or, uh, you know, whatever, being upset about being taken advantage of, etc. Right. So that's what I love about these psychological, I'm sorry, these philosophical ideas that just like in sort of psychology and psychotherapy, it really depends. It depends on who the person is. So, and it's the same thing I think here with the fear of death. Uh, I guess, so I like this in the sense of like, if you have a terror of death, I think this is really applicable, right? So if you're just terrified of death on a daily basis and you know, you're pretty morbid and most of what you can say, let's say you're a hypochondriac and most of what you consider is like how terrible it's going to be in the future and how, oh my God, you know, I'm not going to be able to cope with that. That sounds great. Right. But I think for a person who just has an ordinate fear of death, I think they might take it and they might say, uh, okay, I mean, I don't think about death that often. I mean, I guess maybe if there's a point in my life where I'm terrified of it, this could be applicable. So, but again, that's what I love about philosophy. It's like, uh, none of these are generalizable or none of these are generalized ideas. Well, it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, I mean, a fear of death is essentially, you could just break it down to just fear of just doing things in general. And like some, sometimes, uh, if somebody hears, uh, uh, 
what uh like uh, Parfit's uh, ex- like understanding of you know you're not the same person you were before you've experienced psychological death before es- essentially uh, I mean this could be helpful to a, a person in general because then because all fear in general sort of is related to a fear of death because you you you, you want to prioritize you know the fam- familiarity right. uh, you you sort of want to resist something new something that's going to happen in the future mm-hmm. or or uh you're you're identifying i think you're strongly. saying what i'm saying by the way because yeah. i think we're talking about terror of death not fear because fear the way i just like maybe maybe let me just oh, say terror it. yeah so yeah fear. for me fear uh-huh. is like here like fear is like oh like you know like this really sucks this is uncomfortable but i can still sort of live my life right it's sort of like i don't know like let's say i have a fear of having cancer right and i do right but do i think about it on a daily basis no uh but if it's like if it's stopping me from living then i would describe it as a terror but is that what you were talking oh that's about? what you meant yeah, okay. yeah 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 but that, that, that's why i thought we had the same definition no i just thought you were saying it's to the to a, to a regular person, this may not be useful. This is what I thought you were saying. I, I, I thought you were saying it because they don't think about death all the time, but they think about doing all kinds of challenging things in life right. that maybe being aware that, you you know, that uh, it's, it's not something you have to identify with strongly because right. you already disidentify all the time well not all the time but you you have at some point disidentified from let's say an older version of yourself right so why couldn't you take on this thing that maybe you have some fear or trepidation of doing okay just try to understand right so i yeah. think that what you're saying is that when it comes to the fear of death right the ordinary person doesn't necessarily fear it and on a daily basis right because they don't actually take risks right and if they were to take those risks that fear would become terror and that's what we're trying to prevent is that it got it okay i agree with you I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Okay. And it, it, I was, it's interesting because I was, I was, you know, um, reading about the the podcast and kind of, you know, learning about your 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 backgrounds. I was kind of interested in the clinical cases because one thing that I think comes out of part. I mean, he he explicitly says this is, you know, there's these um, kind of arguments to go back to Socrates that it's that we do this thing as, as human beings where we care, um, we value something more if we get it very soon than if, you know, if we get it further off. So, you know, um, I, I would, if you were to say to me, I'll give you a dollar today or $2 next week, then I might well take the, the dollar today. Right. Um, and, you know, right back to Socrates, they, there's kind of been arguments that have said that's irrational. Socrates thinks he kind of has diagnosed what's irrational about it. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know if anyone would go so far as to say that's so irrational, it kind of becomes a kind of clinical thing. But, it, but the kind of case you were talking about, maybe it does become a clinical thing. If someone's kind of discounting their future selves so dramatically. But one, I think one really nice effect of Parfit's view is it can make sense of why it's actually perfectly rational to discount your future self mm-hmm. and to some extent. And the, the reason is you're just less connected with your future self than you are with your, your far future self than you are with your near future self. So, you know, I'm just much more connected to the person I will be tomorrow than I am to the person I will be when I'm 70. Mm-hmm. And so that, and, and Parfit thinks, you know, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to care less about people we're less connected to than about people we're more connected to. Okay, so now I, I care less about the person I'm going to be when I'm 70 than I care about this. So then it's totally rational to take something now, some lesser thing now for my myself tomorrow than it is to get something. So, okay, so there's loads of cases like this, people saving for pensions and so on, or exactly this sort of thing. But one interesting thing that comes up is, okay, so now Parfit's kind of given us this framework that allows us to understand this. But now you might think there are also kind of people who care so little about far future selves that they're kind of beyond the pale. They're unreasonable in some way, you know. So the person you were talking about, the kind of person who will, you know, the the, the sort of super altruist who who cares nothing of tomorrow's self of theirs and you know everything for other people's selves today, and. And there's this interesting question that comes up with Parfit now that he's kind of recovered the rationality of, of kind of discounting your future selves to some extent, is where does it stop? Where, where does it suddenly become an irrational level of um, a lack of care for future selves? Because if I really think about myself at 70, you know, that's like 30 years off, 
I'm going to tra- change really dramatically, not least because we can all kind of predict that the world will change probably more dramatically in the next 30 years than it has in the last 30 years. So I'm just going to be so radically different that maybe it's perfectly rational for me to hardly even think of that as remotely the same person. And if that's the case, maybe perfectly rational for me to just do, make no efforts to, to do anything for them, you know, kind of create kind of security for retirement and all that sort of thing. Um, so there is this kind of really interesting question that comes up when you start thinking of this is, you know, what, at what point does it become, I mean, maybe kind of irrational to the point of being clinical or just kind of unreasonable or where does it, where does the line sit where, you know, at that point you would say, actually, no, you're kind of beyond the pale now. You're, 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 you've, you've, it's, it's, it's irrational the extent to which you're discounting your, your, your future self. Um, right. Yeah, I was kind of wondering from a kind of clinical point of view, what, what, what you so all right yeah so so just to to be clear right so the question is uh at one point does it become okay so at one point does it become i guess uh necessary for some sort of intervention to occur right when the person uh, you know isn't pretty much considering their future self enough right is that it right i mean well, yeah i mean I'm, I'm not i don't know enough about the kind of oh, um yeah okay kind of yeah. Kind of therapeutic work but just what point would you say it had become kind of it, it was no longer within this kind of spectrum of just, well, there's variation between different people and right, right. how they yeah, care yeah. for themselves and how it becomes an issue. Yeah. So in this case, I would say at the point where it meets the criteria for OCD. So with compulsive altruism, although itself, it's not a clinical term. I mean, it's not, let me not say this. It's, it is a clinical term. It's not a term in the DSM, right? So it isn't a particular diagnosis, but it would fall under the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder. So what we would say then is that if a person meets the criteria for OCD in that respect, so let's say the compulsive altruism, and, and you can have some degree of awareness, FYI, this is what's so interesting. So let's say if the person knows, okay, I know I'm irrationally giving away, you know, all of my things to people, uh, but I can't stop myself, right? So, you know, my obsessive thoughts are, you know, essentially that uh, if I don't give all of my things away, I'm going to be a bad person. Or if I don't give my things away, uh, I'm going to feel, you know, intolerably guilty or something bad is going to happen to these people. And I'm not going to be able to tolerate that, right? So some people might say, okay, I, I there's a self-awareness there. So it's to say, okay, I understand that this is an obsession. I can't stop it, right? And, I, and the compulsions okay. either, right? So we would say in that respect, right, if it's compulsive in the sense of uh, it becomes either clinically distressing, which obviously if you're giving your stuff away, it probably is, meaning you experience severe anxiety throughout the day, right? Or if there's a significant impairment in your daily living. And in this case, yeah, if you're pretty much giving your stuff away, how are you going to take care of yourself? How are you going to feed yourself? How are you going to house yourself, clothe yourself? Uh, How are you going to even go to work, right? I mean, if you're sort of bound up, I mean, obviously these are, this is an extreme case, Uh, but like, you know, if you're bound up in figuring out like, how do I help people, right? And it's sort of, you're not really thinking of yourself. And if the self is, let's say, I would say, if we could kind of chalk it up, if the self is deteriorating in the process of altruism, it becomes pathological, because in some sense, you're killing yourself, right? So that's the that's when it becomes an intervention, right? There's probably a ton of distress. And at the same time, there's a there's a sort of diminishment and an impairment in the quality of life, and the person being able to take care of themselves, even sometimes socializing, they would say, Oh, well, you know what, I don't, I, I, I'm wasting my time socializing, I need to, you know, go, you know, do charity work, or go help this person. And I've known, by the way, a lot of people who would sacrifice just their social lives because they say X, Y, and Z, all of these people need help. And I need to be there for every single one of them. And then they don't have any room for themselves. Maybe their diets are, you know, crappy. Uh, Maybe sort of, they're not thinking of, you know, again, what they have to do for work deadlines, et cetera, because their minds are wrapped up in maybe even their parents, their friends, right? All of these people who are in desperate need for help when it's like, as they're struggling and as they're losing things, these other people are constantly gaining. What did you want to say? No, so uh, just relating to what uh, Richard's asking, which is essentially t- to what degree does it become pathological when essentially you're uh, discounting your future self, right? So, yeah. so it's you're, you're, you're saying it's to the degree that it becomes detrimental. Yeah, literally to the cell. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, there's no sharp cutoff point here. So this is all based on clinical judgment, right? So although the DSM would say when it causes clinically significant distress, or when it causes a clinically significant impairment in the person's quality of life, we're the ones who get to decide that with the client, what is significantly distressful, or obviously, sometimes if you know, they're at a level of where it's so obvious to us and not obvious to them, then we would have to kind of intervene. And we would say, okay, you know, either you may become the therapy, or if obviously, you're some sort of 
sort of danger to yourself. Again, if you're not eating, maybe because you're spending your money on other things, then we would hospitalize you. So it's so interesting Like there's this vague definition of what clinically significant means, but it's honestly, it's based on the interpretation of each individual clinician. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some ways, I think that's always going to be the yeah. always going to be the case. How could, you, how could you ever put anything more kind of concrete in place when lives are so different and diverse and needs are different? But yeah, it's interesting. But it's just because I think there are probably there's a, there are going to be interesting cases. I think where I mean, I mean, this is this just seems right as well that where people aren't meeting any of those kind of worrying um, sort of things, you know, living perfectly. Um, fine, but they've kind of cut everything down to an absolute minimum for themselves right. um, in order to to help others. But they are, you know, I mean, it, it's they've stopped at the minimum. You know, they 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 they, they are, you know, they're they're doing fine um, and and so on. But they're and I think. Yeah, an interesting thing about Parfit is right, that. Like, like, like effective altruists. I just want to say that. If effective altruists, right? Like those people right. are not even anywhere near clinically ill. Like these people no. are incredibly no. rational. They make very right. good decisions for themselves and, other, and, and others, and they have a very good way of, uh, of fostering big picture thinking, right? So those people are not at that point, in that respect, oh, right. diagnosable, right, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. And that's a really interesting case. And Parfit is a very big influence on the effective altruists um, community. And that's not... I think entirely a coincidence. I mean, a large part of his, a large part of I think what he, I mean, how these arguments entire um, exactly line up is is a kind of interesting question. You know, the, the argument about kind of you know think in terms of selves rather than in terms of kind of whole persons. Um, but he also has this kind of general theme, which is we need to move to a kind of impersonal ethics in the sense that you know you, you that that essentially the kind of effective altruist you know attachment to sort of something like utilitarianism that you know what you should be trying to do is kind of maximize kind of impersonal good you know the maximum good across the across everybody not just kind of for you and your close social group um he's he's got that side and that's very much i think an influence on that and he remained in fact very active in that up to his death he would um, he was very involved with a lot of the people who were, you know, are kind of at, at the at the sort of front of that movement. So it's yeah, it's very it's a very close connection. I think that effect of altruist stuff. And by the way, and, and, and since we even talk about, uh, but since we even talked about it, right? What's so interesting about that is I can even imagine somebody who would be sort of conceived of as a compulsive altruist in a community of effective altruism, where the community helps that person manage the symptoms because number one, their behavior is accepted, and number two, it's sort of managed not only as a mirror where you kind of see how other people are doing and how they're managing, but also through the fact that you're essentially gaining the help that you're giving in turn where it's not you know just sort of people uh people kind of using you or whatever you know sort of taking advantage of you you have a you know these communities of effective altruists where they're saying like no no hey here's your limit right and it's okay for you to have your limit so or again back as a mirror you're like oh i see okay so i can keep being an altruist and i could keep helping people but i also need to help myself and you kind of view these people as somewhat of a role model right so i can see that being really helpful for somebody with ocd and that kind of a in that kind of manifestation Right, right, yeah, um, yeah. That's that's interesting, and yeah, and I think it's an interesting kind of. Um, I mean, it's it's one of these things that sort of uh, highlights this point that you know, uh, behaviors that can kind of be kind of concerning in in one con social kind of community context can end up being yeah. not at all in another one because the, you know the community is you know, everybody lives their lives around um, communities, and and so it really much depend it very much depends on your social kind of grouping what whether a particular sort of behavior is going to uh, yeah be harmful to you i guess um, yeah yeah and, and also i mean the other question that i had for you is uh i mean this is also psychological obviously as well as philosophical but do you think that having this um having this concept of a changing self is in any way or could be in any way helpful to the person sort of, uh, you know, thinking or wondering if they're going to be stuck in a particular personality pattern or patterns forever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's sort of fascinating. I think, um, so this is actually in a lot of ways more that the, the side of this that I've, I've done some work on is, is questions, not so much about sort of morality or or thinking about death but about personal choice and kind of rational um you know decisions life decisions so i mean i got into the whole thing thinking about the question about whether to become a parent um 
And I think, so, you know, the, the, the kind of puzzle that's brought up around that is quite often people will um, not really value, you know, they, they've, they've kind of, they've, they've got to a stage where they've, they're, they're needing to decide really, are they going to become a parent or, or not? And if they really consult their own values, you know, what they, what they, what they really want in the world, they really want not to be a parent. Um, you know, they, they, they really value the, the, the time that they have that would otherwise go to kind of bringing up the child. They really value this kind of, maybe the group of friends that they have that, um, you know, they, they, they know they will spend less time with if they become a parent. Perhaps they do a whole bunch of volunteering work or the, you know, effective altruists. They do a bunch of sort of stuff around that and they know they're just gonna have way less time for that. So maybe currently that's what they think. But they've also seen a bunch of people who've become parents and maybe they, a lot of the people they've seen become parents were like them before as well and then they changed um you know after becoming parents to really valuing that and saying well look this is my kid i love my kid and i i would never um i you know i have no regrets whatsoever i would i would not want to be living the life without them so they know that that sort of change is possible and they've now got to make the choice. And it seems very strange anyone who then makes the choice to become a parent because, you know, what all the traditional rational choice theory that was kind of developed throughout the 20th century says is, well, well, not even just throughout the 20th century, this is kind of um, accounts of rationality going back hundreds of years. What you should do is, you know, what you want to do, you know, that you should, um, you know, do whatever will fulfill your desires unless there's some like moral component but let's say there's no real moral component to whether or not to have a child um but so so there's the miss the mystery you know i currently don't want to become a parent and yet I, I go and become a parent say how do i explain that one explanation for it might be exactly what you just said you know that you kind of want to explore other forms of life you there's something that you value that is not the actual life you will have but rather being a person whose whole life taken from kind of birth to death has variety in it, where you, you kind of have inhabited different ways of living and, and, and so on. And so I think, yeah, the kind of knowledge that there's these ways of, um, other ways of living out there, and they involve not just kind of doing different things, but having a different personality, you know, being a, um, a different sort of person with different values. I think, you know, Ullman Margalit's example of joining a revolution might be like this. You might have someone who joins, who's actually a slightly reluctant revolutionary. They're actually not particularly radical themselves, but there's something they just want to change. They want to kind of burst out of the self that they are now. They want to be a different self, even though actually, if they think about it, they don't really value what they're about to become, but they know they're going to join the revolution, they're going to hang out with a bunch of revolutionaries, they're going to become radicals, people rub off on us. So I absolutely think that that's a, um, a really valuable part of, um, of thinking this way. That, But it's very strange on Parfit's view because you're essentially choosing the death of your current self right. and the birth of this new self. And it's not like you think this new self is somehow a better person or an improvement. They're just a different one. And uh, yeah, you, you think that's a good thing, though, that you can choose to do that. So I absolutely think this idea, yeah. That made, that made me think of uh, Woody Allen's 1971 movie, Bananas. Have you ever seen it? I don't know. I haven't seen oh, it. Yeah. Oh. I haven't seen it oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's ancient. I think I guess it's one of his first movies. Yeah, so it's a, obviously a comedy. So he, he joins... Um, Oh my God, where was it? I think Bolivia or something. So he joins the revolution in Bolivia because there's some, some woman he meets, uh, I, think, I guess in, in New York. So he meets this woman in New York who's like a very left wing. And then she's like, hey man, like, I'm sorry, I have to break up with you. And he's like, wait, why? I don't understand. She's like, I don't know. It's just, you're, you're missing something. And he's like, but what is it? Tell me, what am I missing? I'll do, I'll change whatever, whatever it is, I'll do it. And then she's like, I, I just, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. And then so he's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go down to South America and I'm going to join a revolution. I'm going to help top top of a fascist dictator and that's what he does to win her back yeah and does, right. he, does he win her back yeah no 
<laughs> oh no actually he does he by the way he does he does so he puts on like a fake a mustache and beard right and so he actually she meets him again right so she meets him again and she's like oh my god it's you you're like so amazing you know everybody like you know is raving about you in the united states and he's like oh great right and then so he sleeps with her and then he's like i have something to tell you he takes off his beard and she's like oh my god and he's like yup it's me and she's like i knew something was missing <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, it's obviously, uh, I mean, the point is, you know, kind of satire and comedy, but it's also an interesting kind of take on how we do sort of absurd things that, oh, and maybe this is like another thing to potentially explore, right? It's like how we sometimes go against what our personalities are, what our tendencies are, and maybe even some of the things we want, right, for some greater result at the end. Because in this case, right, Woody Allen clearly had no interest in a rebel. He wasn't even left wing in the film, right? He had, he had very right. limited, right. very limited political views, if any, right? But the reason why he does this and the reason why he goes through this abrupt personality change is for this the result that doesn't really even happen so it's also kind of interesting that even as we're changing our personality sometimes when we're not doing so for i guess the right reasons what can even question just like with becoming a parent and not wanting to is this really a parent because if they don't want to be a parent i mean can we say that just having a child makes one a parent i'm not sure well i think right okay i mean i think that's right but what's i think one thing that's interesting is that in some ways that sort of you might think sort of inauthentic reason for doing the thing can nonetheless lead to an authentic change. So, I mean, when you were telling that, the, the story of the, the film, I was thinking, I'm sure there's some other kind of film or, or book or something out there with a, with a, a story a bit like that, but I'm, I'm forgetting it now. But I, in the case that I was thinking of, the, the person goes and maybe joins a revolution or whatever for the wrong reason but in fact when they do it they then no longer in fact want the thing that they did it for in the first place and I so I think I think it is I mean I I'm a strong believer in this that we make a big deal out of the kind of um the sources of our personality or the sources of our um our our moral beliefs or our morality or something and sometimes we categorize some of them as kind of authentic sources and some of them as less authentic sources you know so you're somehow you know you're somehow less authentic um as a revolutionary if the only reason you became a revolutionary was because you know you wanted to um get together with someone but if you it seems to me at least that if, even if that was your initial kind of motivation if you then genuinely do inhabit all of the kind of moral sensibilities of being that that person then you have become that person just as authentically as the kind of very pious person who kind of got into it originally from some other way i just i think yeah the, there's this sort of feeling that somehow yeah the the the, the story behind how you got to the kind of set of morals or personality that you have now is somehow a, a kind of deep um uh you know reason for judging someone one way or the other and it seems to me that 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 seems to me wrong it seems to me that in fact people can um become very authentically one thing so i would say in the parent case in some ways of course yeah if you if you just become a um, parent if you just have a child but you don't take on any of the kind of values that are meant to go along with that like kind of loving the child and kind of you know um kind of wanting the best then yeah you you probably don't count as a proper parent but if ha by having the child you somehow do get all of that stuff even if you didn't go into it for that reason even if you went into i don't know for really selfish reasons or something like that then yeah you've still become you know the kind you're still just as authentically that that person, that parent, you've still got those sensibilities just as authentically. But it's a difficult question, I think. Like what, you know, if you could take a pill that would make you a different person, would that really make you authentically the different person? Or would there be something dicey there? And you know what's so interesting when uh, when the behavioral therapists treat children, and I mean technically parents, because you're not just ever treating children; you're also treating parents at the same time. So what you're doing usually for a child, like let's say somebody with oppositional defiance, and somebody who's like maybe really disruptive, uh, doesn't follow the rules. So initially, you'd set rewards for them, right? So the idea there is like, okay, you know, if you get an hour of homework done tonight, you'll get an hour, maybe over thirty minutes, but. 
30 minutes to an hour of video games, right? So the kid would do the homework, let's say for the reward, right? So the idea there is like, oh, okay, you know, I'm doing this because I have something in mind, right? Uh, I'm sorry, some like a uh, sort of physical or whatever activity in mind, right? There's something to look forward to. So, but over some time, the reward itself in some sense becomes the homework. So what happens is the reward goes from external to internal, right? So as you're giving the person the reward, right? You would actually keep asking the kid, hey, are you proud of yourself? And the kid would say, uh, I don't give a shit. Homework, who cares? It's homework. It's just school, right? Yeah. They're like, okay, well, because I'm really proud of you. I mean, that homework looked really hard, right? And it, sound, and it seemed like you had to be really diligent and you had to really persist in it because you seemed really like you were struggling, but you still got it done, right? So eventually the kid is like, well, I mean, so initially the kid is like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. I just want to go play games. Okay. So the next time comes around and you say, oh, wow. Oh my God. Like, you know, I remember how much you used to struggle in this subject, right? And you did your homework again. Do you feel proud today? No, not really. I just want to still play video games. Right. And then, but over some time as this develops, the kid is like, wow, man, like, holy shit. Like I'm actually really resilient. And yeah, maybe dad's right. You know, or mom, or I am like really persistent and I did improve. Right. And here's the subject that I really struggled with that I got really, I got better at it. And you could kind of do this with anything that requires, um, or that not maybe requires, but that involves some sort of personal trait. So whether, even if it's goodness, right. You could say, Hey, you know, if you give your sister, uh, let's say if you share, you know, your dessert, with her, I will give you something in the end, right? But then if you say, hey, don't you don't you feel happy about making your sister happy? I mean, you know, she seems pretty happy that you shared her dessert with her. And again, the kid would say, I don't I don't care. I'm just looking forward to my 30 minutes of video games or whatever it is. Right. But then after some time, it kind of hits him and he's like, yeah, you know what? I don't think I need the reward. I think the action in itself is the reward. Right. The fact that I get to feel like, again, I'm resilient, I'm persistent, I'm diligent. And even in this case, I'm generous. Right. So it's like the rewards at the beginning are the end. Right. But then at some sense, um, yeah, at some sense, this sort of end in itself becomes the sort of the feeling or the the sort of activity that you're doing so it's kind of interesting how yeah and i guess i think that that's kind of character development for everybody as like we grow up we start caring so much about external right. rewards and right and you know this right positive psychology uh you know even i think maybe social psychology i could be wrong but we have like these concepts of intrinsic rewards and extrinsic rewards right eventually you as you're kind of developing you're moving away from the external rewards and you're going obviously you're focusing more so on the internal ones mm. yeah yeah and i think you know, it's that sort of, but in some ways it's that sort of example that makes people skeptical that, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the in, internalizing of the external reward that you just described of the, you know, the, the, the feeling proud of themselves or kind of feeling proud of being generous. I think it's that that makes people worry about that sort of thing a bit. They sometimes think, oh, well, you know, if, if the only reason that you have this kind of generous spirit is because, you know, it was kind of super drummed into you or you were kind of endlessly rewarded for it, then you're a bit of kind of like, you know, you've just been conditioned in some way to be like this. And I think my view of that is just that that's just all of human life. That's just all of, you know, you could try to find me a source of generous spirits that is somehow more pure or more virtuous than that you know some people will say oh well some people are just born with you know that kind of um that internal sort of virtue is like well but they didn't earn that either they do you know that's that's just kind of been bequeathed to them by genetics perhaps or something like that so i think this i think it's a kind of um yeah an important uh thing with this that i at least feel that it's very difficult at least to find yeah what the pure source of a particular kind of virtue would have to be in order to really count it as, as the genuine virtue or something like that, as opposed to some conditioned virtue or some kind of internalization of an external reward or something. So, yeah, yeah. I, love um, I, I love that so much. And I think that that's such a great point to end off on. Alan, final questions for Richard before we go. Oh, yes. Uh, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, uh, where could we find you? Where can we find me? I am. So I have a website, um, www richardpettigrew.com um, and I'm also on Twitter under the rather um, inexplicable handle at Wiglet, W-I-G-L-E-T and then 1981. Um, but yeah, so um, but my, my, my website has any of um, all of the kind of um, uh, more academic stuff and yeah, links to blogs and things like that. But yeah, awesome. thank you very much. Yeah, thank absolutely. you so much for coming and, on. Yeah, the, you go, promote the book. I, oh yeah, of course, this is the book, Philosophy Illustrated. Uh, available <laughs> at uh, local retailers, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, you name it. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and obviously, Richard, thank you so much. Episode as I thought it would literally met our expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Very pleased. That's terrific. Thanks so much, folks.
Awesome. Absolutely. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers. All right. That was awesome. Out back. All right. Well, everybody, uh, guys, you know where to follow us. You can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram, and as well as TikTok, and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. And thank you so much for watching. See you next time.